again everyone, welcome back to another episode of Final Fantasy Brave Exvius. My name is Mars, and today we're going to be doing the complete guide on Xeno of the Beta Star. And let me tell you, there is nothing beta about this unit at all. Xeno is quite the impressive damage dealer who features the new and improved true dual wield coming early to global version of Brave Exvius. So there's a lot to unpack with this unit and a lot to look at. He, at first glance, is kind of a complicated unit, but hopefully this video can help break it down so that you know exactly what you need to do to get the most out of his damage. We'll also look at a couple of his builds and as well as some considerations of, of whether or not he's worth your investment because while he is definitely the strongest potential damage dealer in the game, there are some things you want to think about. So without further ado, uh, let's talk about some of the highlights of Xeno of the Beta Star. Now, he innately has 200% true dual wield when he has his Trustmaster reward equipped. And this is pretty huge. That's a lot of attack that just comes from having that TMR equipped. Most true dual wield damage dealers who come down the line, they're going to need additional equipment to hit that 200% cap. But Xeno of the Beta Star comes with it basically right out of the box, which is pretty amazing. This makes him a great unit for newcomers and older players alike because it means you can dive right into that true dual wield meta without having to invest in any of the equipment. So for me, that's a pretty big plus. Now if we want to talk about some of the different elements of his kit, he does have a ton of different abilities which can make it even more confusing how to get the most use out of him. For example, with Scorch, you have a single target, 100% 5 turn fire and peril, which is awesome. It's also a chaining ability. And you also have Blazing Heat, which is a personal fire imbue, as well as Faraga Slash, which is another personal fire imbue. Uh, he's just got stuff coming out of his butt. Like, he's got so much stuff in his kit. The majority of the skills that he has, he has a lot of skills called Mirror of Equity dash something. The majority of the time, you're not going to use most of these skills. Uh, the bulk of his rotation revolves around using his cooldown skills, his imperil, and his limit burst in combination with his strongest chaining ability, which is Obliterating Mirror of Equity's Roar, which I'm just going to refer to as Roar. Um, that's the most unique word in the name, so that's what I'm going to go with to describe the skill. So Roar is his most powerful chaining ability, and most of the other abilities that you use help to beef it up. So we're going to take a quick look at a five turn opening rotation graphic. This will hopefully make it as easy as possible for you to digest what his rotation kind of looks like, or, or it's a setup. I mean, it's not a true rotation um, because you won't rep repeat this perfectly, but it is a quick little setup to help you get started. So when you are using Xeno of the Beta Star, Perfect Void and Scorch are the two abilities that you're going to want to use on your first turn to optimize your damage. And this is because Perfect Void is a cooldown skill that lasts for, or it's a, it, you can use it once every 10 turns, but the benefits that you get also last for 10 turns as well. So it's one of those things where you want to use it as soon as possible, get the benefit of those buffs. Um, and so what it gives you is a 250% attack buff for 10 turns. Now Xeno of the Beta Star automatically buffs himself, his, his attack stat by 200% at the start of each turn. So it gives an extra 50% attack for 10 turns, which is nice. The other thing that it does that is more important is that it increases the modifier by 1x or 1x or 1 times, whatever you call it, 100% for most of his mirror abilities and most importantly roar roar gets buffed by a one times modifier so you want to use perfect void because then all of your subsequent roars will be doing increased damage now the next ability that you want to use on your first turn is scorch and this is a 100 percent fire in peril <clears throat> so this is going to be a huge deal because if your opponent is fire neutral as in they're not weak to or strong against fire this is going to basically <laughs> double your outgoing damage for the next five turns. Now on turn two, uh, what you choose to do is going to be dependent on whether or not you have an elemental weapon equipped. If you have an elemental weapon equipped, i.e. if you have a fire weapon equipped, then you can just use two obliterating mirror of equities roar. And that's gonna get your stacks building faster with that ability. But if you do not have an elemental weapon equipped, then you want to use ash instead. Uh, I believe it's blazing heat ash or you can use Firaga Slash. Both of those do the same thing. 
Um, Scorch is, or sorry, not Scorch. Ash is a divine ruination skill. So it will chain with different frames. Um, and then Firaga Slash is absolute mirror of equity. So depending on who you're chaining with, select the one that makes the most sense for you. Um, I do believe you want to use Ash when you're chaining with an Axe Star because Axe Star self imbue is divine ruination as well. So go ahead and get that imbue on yourself. It is innately fire damage and that's why you want to use it on turn two so that you can take advantage of Scorch's in peril and then use a roar as your second ability for that turn. And uh, keep in mind, if you do have an elemental weapon equipped and you're just using roar twice, you don't actually have to dual cast it. Just cast it one time, you're dual wielding, it'll go out twice, it'll give you the benefit of stacking twice. It's exactly the same as multicasting when you are true dual wielding. Now on your third turn, this is one when you want to activate your limit burst, of course, if it's available. <laughs> it can be difficult for some people to get on this turn. It is recommended because in addition to doing some pretty substantial damage, the limit burst increases the modifier for uh, obliterating roar by three times for four turns, which is pretty humongous. That's, that's a really big increase in damage. So. If by turn three you can get that up, maybe you need some Entrust or some AoE Limit Burst fill, get that up, third turn, activate your Limit Burst, that's going to set you up for success with the following two Burst turns. So speaking of those turns, turn four is when you want to activate True Mirror and Roar. Now True Mirror of, it's called True Mirror of Equity, and it is another absolute mirror of, tra of equity chaining ability. It, does a fair amount of damage, it actually does quite a bit of damage. Not as much as Roar at this point, but it does a lot of damage. And it also increases the modifier for Roar. And, and this is where things start getting crazy because you've stacked modifier on top of modifier on top of Roar, and then you've used a Roar at the end of that turn. And uh, this, is, this is where your damage comes in because the last thing that True Mirror of Equity does is it gives you Triple Blade Art, which allows you to triple cast for the following turn. And that's what turn 5 is. This is when you're really hitting with the big, big, big damage. This is your huge burst turn. Um, and it, <laughs> it hits like a dump truck. Like it's, it's pretty crazy the amount of damage it does. Um, I'm pretty sure I could have killed Gilgamesh Kai almost two times over chaining this skill or on this triple cast turn alone. It's ridiculous, um, and this is the burst that you kind of want to go for. Now, if whatever you're attacking happens to be alive, which I highly doubt it would be, but if it does happen to survive uh, by turn five, then you basically start this rotation over, except instead on turn one using Perfect Void, because it will, Perfect Void will still be on cooldown. Instead, you want to use Scorch and Ash or Firaga Blade if you need to re-imbue, or you can just use Scorch and Roar if you have an elemental weapon equipped. And then go right back into the same rotation that you see here. True Mirror will be up right in time for you at turn 4 again. And then you can do your triple cast obliterating Mirror of Equity's Roar. So that's kind of a rundown of what his rotation looks like. It is a little bit obnoxious sometimes, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that I ran into is if a boss doesn't want you to be using a neat little rotation like this, it's going to get in your way. Um, good example is Gilgamesh or Asura who buff themselves in ways that need to be dispelled. So your Scorch debuff that you apply on turn 1 might be gone by turns 4 or 5, and that's a problem because your damage will be cut in half without, a, without that imperil. Of course, assuming neutral element susceptibility. So. Kind of obnoxious, but if you can if you can get this rotation off, this is your optimal five turn burst, and it will kill pretty much anything in the game. It's obscene. Now, speaking of builds, I did want to touch on that a little bit. Uh, let's take a quick look at an example of kind of the upper echelon build. This is where you have basically every item at your disposal. Uh, you have you, you, if you have access to Zeno's STMR, absolutely get it. Do not use two 7-star Xeno of the Beta Star. It's not really worth it. Uh, definitely put all of your eggs in one basket on this one. Go for Searing Ember. It is a great STMR. Now, for those of you who have been fortunate enough to pull four Nyxes, you're going to want to use Nyx's Dagger on Xeno of the Beta Star because in addition to being Fire Element, uh, which is awesome, it also gives a buttload of defense, a buttload of HP, a buttload of elemental resistance, and you can roll High Tide on it with Item World and it's fire element. So all together, this is this is gonna be your weapon combo if you are somebody who happens to have access to these. And we'll talk about some more budget options down the line, but 
essentially, if you have this, you want to go with this. Now, there are going to be circumstances where you're better off not equipping an elemental weapon, and these situations are usually pretty uncommon. If you happen to have, for example, two STMR weapons for Xeno to use that are at or above roughly 170 attack, and you don't have Nyx's dagger, that's probably when you would want to consider using a non-elemental weapon instead. Use both of those STMRs, get that super high attack, uh, because dropping to a Flaming Blade Agni or a, uh, is it Homaru, the Fire Katana? Dropping to those loses you a ton of attack, and so there are those cases for some people where you are better off equipping two elementless, non-elemental weapons, um, and then self-imbuing because you would otherwise lose out on a couple hundred attack, which is, it's pretty huge. Um, so if you have Nyx's dagger, go with that. Uh, now if you're somebody who's looking at more of a budget side of things, not to worry, um, I would 100% recommend if you don't have an STMR weapon, um, stick with Murasama, which you get from Gilgamesh Kai. Uh, this is a really great weapon in addition to being 172 attack, which is awesome. It also gives you Man Eater, which is awesome. And then equip a fire weapon. You can use Flaming Blade Agni if you need additional uh, attack passives granted from Great Swords, or you can use Homaru if you have plenty of attack percentage. Now, as far as um, headpiece, you always want to have Obsidian Helm on, regardless of which build you use. That's where he gets the additional 100% true dual wield from, and it is a really good helmet to boot. Gives him immunity to a lot of important status ailments, in addition to uh, giving a lot of flat attack and some MP. Now, in this build, I've opted to use Hyo's clothes, although you can use any attack clothes that you have. Anything with flat attack is great. And then for the accessories, you do want to use whatever has high flat attack. So Queen's STMR is going to give you the most. However, I think that uh, Esther's TMRs are probably going to be better off for you because you do get the extra limit burst damage, which is very handy. But uh, odds are, if you have Esther's STMR or TMRs, you're using Esther. So <laughs> you know you maybe you maybe won't be using them on Zeno himself. So. Uh, if all else fails, Desh's earrings is plus 45 attack, and these are great for him. So, as much flat attack as possible on the, uh, the non-materia side of equipment. Now, as far as his materias go, um, I mean, you'll find out very quickly. Once you run his weapons through item world, it's pretty easy to cap him out at 400% attack. Especially now that we have Gravy's TMR, Disparate Swordsman. This is something I highly, highly recommend. Most of Xeno's passives are attached to katanas. And if you have clothes equipped, then you can just get an extra 70% attack from a Materia slot. So easy peasy, lemon squeezy. You can go with a Katana Mastery, or if you have uh, Reagan's TMR, that's also a good one. Um, or even if you have Crimson's TMR, that's another thing you can use if you're using a great sword and clothes. There's a ton of options out there. Use what gets you the most. Now, in this build, I've also featured War Goddesses Insignia because all I needed to reach the 400% cap was another 30% attack, and uh, we get a little extra LB damage bonus on the side with War Goddess Insignia of an extra 30%. So, if you, if, you know you just need an extra 30% to close that gap, go ahead and slot something in that will give you a little extra benefit. Now, the nice thing about Xeno the Beta Star is that you can hit that 400% attack, 200% true dual wield and still have at least a slot to spare in, in most cases. And so that's where that's where Xeno starts to shine is that you get that opportunity to slot in a materia without having to sacrifice attack. And uh, in this build we featured Maneater Plus alongside Diabolos and Murasama, so we have 250% Maneater, which is pretty crazy, <laughs> not gonna lie, I'm a huge fan of that. And uh, that's ultimately the direction you want to go. Now a lot of people are going to be asking, well, is Xeno of the Beta Star worth it for me to get? Um, I feel like this is a conversation for me to have at greater length at another time, but what I will say is that if you have Esther, do not feel compelled to pull for Xeno of the, Be Zeno of the Beta Star. Um, also, if you pulled Axstar on the chase for Xeno, don't feel like you have to UOC Xeno. Axstar is an amazing character as well. Um, I know a lot of people have felt some frustration that they're like, oh, Axstar is dead on arrival, or Axstar is the troll on his own banner, or, or things like that. And quite frankly, it's not true. Another unit being strong doesn't make, you know, the 
previous unit weak, it just means that there's something stronger out there, and that's always going to be the case. Uh, this is a gacha game after all, and we've watched them do this for years on end, so if anybody's surprised by it at this point, uh, it's probably your fault more than anything else. Um, but yeah, if you have Axtar, if you have Esther, I would say Zeno is, is a luxury pull. It's something that if you really want him, then you can go for him. Um, if you don't have Esther or Axtar and you have the resources to pull a damage dealer, uh, I think Zeno is a very wise investment because of how gear friendly he is. He is very easy to equip with some, some good stuff to get him to very high attack. I mean, he blows the attack parameter mission out of the water, obviously. Very versatile unit, very tanky unit as well. Um, I know a lot of people have said, oh, Zeno's not as good as Esther because he's not very tanky. Uh, he's he's still quite tanky. Like, there's, he, he's not going to die a lot. He's certainly tankier than a lot of the damage dealers that we've had flow through before. So, overall, I think that he's an extremely high value damage dealer. And the good news is, if you do pull for him now and you do get him now, you don't have to pull for another damage dealer for probably at least another 12 months, by which point he'll get enhancements and then you'll have another 6 to 12 months of value out of him. So it's one of those things where if uh, if you really want him and you want to get a lot of mileage out of a single unit that you chase for, Zeno's not a bad one to go for, especially because the off banner split is with Axtar, who also, it's the same story. Axtar can clear all of the current and future content that we are aware of. So in that regard, it's kind of a win-win situation. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts on Zeno. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. How have you built your Zeno? Uh, how have you used him? What are you most impressed by? I want to hear your thoughts, impressions down in the comments below, and then I will see everybody in the next video. Come